chosen people, proclaim the mighty works of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who in the celebration of Easter graciously give to the world the healing of heavenly remedies, show benevolence to your church, that our present observance may benefit us for eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. On the following Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews heard, saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, and with violent abuse contradicted what Paul said. Both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and condemn yourselves as unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have made you a light to the nation, to the Gentiles, that you may be an instrument of salvation to the ends of the earth. The Gentiles were delighted when they heard this and glorified the word of the Lord. All who were destined for eternal life came to believe, and the, whole, and the word of the Lord continued to spread through the whole region. The Jews, however, incited the women of prominence who were worshippers, and the leading men of the city stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their territory. So they shook the dust from their feet to, in protest against them, and went to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Oh, all the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. All the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wondrous deeds. His right hand has won victory for him, his holy arm. All the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. The Lord has made his salvation known. In the sight of the nations, he has revealed his justice. He has remembered his kindness and his faithfulness toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation by our God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, all you lands. Break into song, sing praise. All the ends of the earth have seen the saving power of God. seen him. Philip said to Jesus, Master, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. 
Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and that the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and will do greater ones than these, because I am going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything of me in my name, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Luke's Gospel is often remembered, and rightly so remembered, for being the Gospel and he being the evangelist who were sensitive to the outcast. He, beyond all the other apostles, um, evangelists, gives the most emphasis on Christ's female disciples, on the women who followed him, and paints them in the most convincing and thorough light. He's the one who emphasizes how Christ comes to preach the good news to the poor, not simply the poor in spirit, but the poor as such. And many of his accounts throughout the gospel emphasize Christ's solicitude for such outcasts, the Good Samaritan, the healing of various folks in poverty. There's an emphasis in Luke that the kingdom of God involves the odd man out. And in a sense, it can't get started until he shows up to the feast. You see this emphasis in the other Gospels of how the downtrodden are to be welcomed, but there's almost a sense in the whole Gospel of Luke, much like in the story of the prodigal son itself, that the feasting that the father would send and, and celebrate can't start until the prodigal son gets home. Everyone else there was happy enough in the story of the prodigal son, no? But the party can't start till the guy who spent his father's inheritance on prostitutes gets home, and then the party can start. That parable is an encapsulation of the whole idea that Luke has for what the kingdom of God entails. Now you might say, well, we have the Gospel of John. Where did we hear from Luke? Well, the Acts of the Apostles is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. The two are intimately related, and even the most hard-nosed scholars who would deny that Luke wrote it, who would sooner postulate that a Martian wrote it, or someone on the planet Xenu, or what have you, and, in, and even, even if they're willing to admit that someone else had to write it, however weird their theory might be, just about everyone admits that Acts and Luke were written by the same person. And we see in the account from Acts of the Apostles today a different sort of exclusion. Because it's interesting, normally, of course, Luke identifies with those who stand out, who don't quite fit in, who don't quite get it. But we have here the authorities, the Jewish authorities, who are jealous of the crowds, of the Gentile crowds, that Paul and Barnabas, preaching the gospel, have whipped up in their city, such that the entire city is present to hear the word of God. And yet, the Jewish authorities, called here the Jews, are, are jealous of I think we're often reluctant to preach on this mystery because it can imply that we extend this description to every Jew and every point of history, which we certainly should not and indeed cannot do. It wouldn't be fair. But if we take Luke as a reliable witness here, we recognize how in this particular case, a group of people, a small group of people in a particular city, we're jealous of the spiritual progress and good of others. And this is the very heart of spiritual death. St. Thomas Aquinas and others will explain the various sins against the Holy Spirit. You may remember the passage phrased in Luke and in Matthew both of how any word speak, spoken against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the sin committed against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. To speak of the sin of the Holy Spirit does not mean that we reject the forgiveness of all sin. 
Christ came to save sinners, and he wills that all be saved, all men be saved, and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that would include the most inveterate of sinners. But there are some sins, these sins against the Holy Spirit, that by their own commission threaten the very dynamic of being saved. We preach much on mercy, but what do we say to those who maintain that they're not in need of mercy? We preach understanding, but what do we say of those who have adopted a false sense of understanding, or have, on account of their attitudes or assumptions, alienated themselves from others to such a great degree? Sins against the Holy Spirit undercut the very dynamic of what it means to be saved. And that doesn't mean that we write anyone off. That is not our job. But we do have to be honest and open about the implications that it carries. And to be jealous of another's spiritual good, to willingly and deliberately fail to see the good that is going on, or worse, to see that good and to reject it, darkens the intellect and perverts the will to the point where light itself will be oppressive to such a person. This is not an excuse to write anyone off, but it is a warning to any of us. This is not simply some polemic against the Jews. It is not. It's rather a warning for any Gentile, any nation under heaven, that would, in arrogance or laziness or obstinacy, resist the work of God. And if we're prepared to see it on the part of others, we have to be even more ready to see it on our own part. Despair, presumption, impugning the known truth, being envious of another's spiritual good, persisting or persevering in manifest sin. There's a sixth one that I forget. These are what are traditionally called the sins of the Holy Spirit, and they are legion even in our own time. We have a media that pushes presumption if you're in one political party, and despair if you're in another, and it often depends on who's in power and who's arguing about what. And that's not to say there aren't real discussions on TV, there often are, but let's be honest, all of it is overshadowed with the despair and the presumption of the present affairs. Impugning the known truth is regularly done by spin doctors, by politicians, and even by the media themselves. And we play into this more often than we might care to admit. And then this particular facet of being envious of another spiritual good of having that resistance, that obstinacy in the face of the blessings that unfold throughout the world. For the, for the blessings are poured forth on the just and the unjust. They are poured forth on those who deserve them on some level, and on those who do not really deserve them, because ultimately none of us deserve them. And if we are to be made worthy of them, it takes God's initiative. And if we find ourselves bristling at God's initiative in the face of our apparent scheme of how things should go, then cursed are we, woe to us, because we are in that very act putting up roadblocks to the whole dynamic of salvation. The importance of seeing things aright comes with the very definition of faith, which is to be responsive to the truth who is speaking, namely God, and to think with assent, to accept what he has to say, and be ready from that to see. Faith isn't simply opinion. Faith isn't simply knowledge. Faith is a fruit of goodwill, such that the angels in the Christmas story can say peace to men of goodwill. Our peace can only flow from that conformity of will to the way things are. And when our will is conformed to the way things are, we can see rightly, and we can find the peace for which we long. As for those who fail to recognize it, we've come to know in various ways, through psychology and sociology, that there are various mitigating factors that might explain why someone might be obstinate or might be deaf to something. But we cannot, because of those explanations, write off the possibility that there's a deeper issue at stake. And in our own lives and in the lives of others, we have to respond with understanding, but also challenge, knowing that proposition of the gospel is a serious affair, that God will not be mocked, and that the question is not whether God will welcome us back, it's whether we will have it in us to seek his mercy. An inclination, a petition, 
a set of prayer that can only come through the grace of God himself, a gift itself that must be accepted. The good news is that it is nothing less than God's intention that we do so. The bad news is that we have the capability within ourselves and our neighbor has the capability within himself to turn it away. And so regardless of these weighty matters, our response remains the same, to love, to be merciful, to be understanding, but also to be ready to challenge. Good luck, it's a lot to balance. But if we are to really reach the marginalized, the most marginalized, we have to be ready to remedy the most serious of things. And when it comes to the work of grace, things that lie beyond our immediate power, things that are not within our control, we can only radiate the joy, the peace, and the understanding that God himself has shown us, and hope that by extension it will mean something in the lives of those that we might judge as wayward. And God willing, when we come home, we might realize that given the circumstances, we may well have been more wayward than them, given the amount of light they had versus us. But ultimately, when it comes to who gets to heaven, I love the line of Fulton Sheen, that there's going to be three kinds of people, there's going to be three kinds of reactions we have when we get to heaven. We're going to be surprised at who's there. We're going to be surprised at who isn't there. And lastly, and more importantly, we're going to be surprised that we're there. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Graciously sanctify these gifts, O Lord, we pray, and accepting the oblation of this spiritual sacrifice, make of us an eternal offering to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But in this time above all, to laud you yet more gloriously, when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Through him the children of light rise to eternal life, and the halls of the heavenly kingdom are thrown open to the faithful. For his death is our ransom from death, and in his rising the life of all has risen. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, 
You give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, pray that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit, in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with our Holy Father, St. Dominic, with St. Antoninus of Florence, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Please to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Leonard, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen gracious into the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, you cut admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever. Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Christ our Lord was handed over for our transgressions, and was raised again for our justification. Alleluia. Let us pray. Keep safe, O Lord, we pray, those whom you have saved by your kindness, that redeemed by the passion of your Son, they may rejoice in his resurrection, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. The Novena Prayer to Our Lady of Fatima. <clears throat> o Mary, Our Lady of the Rosary, Mother of God, Queen of the Angels and of the Saints, I salute thee with the most profound veneration and filial devotion. I renew the consecration of myself and all that I have to thee. I thank thee for thy maternal protection and for the many blessings that I have received through thy wondrous mercy and most powerful intercession. In all my necessities, I have recourse to thee with unbounded confidence. O help of Christians, O mother of mercy, I beseech thee now to hear my prayer and to obtain for me of thy divine Son the favor that I ask in this domain. 
obtain for me also, dearest mother, the grace that I may imitate thee and become more like to thee in the practice of the virtues of humility, obedience, purity, poverty, submission to the will of God, and charity. Be my protectress in life, guard and guide me in dangers, direct me in perplexities, lead me in the way of perfection, and assist me in the hour of my death, that I may come to Jesus and with thee adore him and love him eternally in heaven. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgins, O virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy clemency hear and answer me. Amen. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace and life perpetual shine upon them. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan, and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen.